You know what's crazy? As long as the Muppets have been around, as popular as the Muppets are, there is a staggeringly low amount of Muppet lore content on YouTube. I mean, you got a lot of stuff on Jim Henson, like the Defunct Land documentary, an absolute masterclass of a video essay. You got people like uh, that Dan guy who does a history, but that's a lot about the puppets themselves, a little about the characters, but more so about the actual felt than the heart and the soul. You got a bunch of reviews of Muppet movies, and of course, you got people complaining about Disney absolutely beefing the IP, but you don't see a lot of deep Muppet lore, the interpersonal connection that these characters share, their personalities, their history together, how they relate. Take for instance the iceberg, one of the most popular crazes on YouTube here in the last few years. You search Muppet iceberg at the time of this recording, you will find one, count it, one single Muppet iceberg. And a lot of that's on Jim Henson and Fraggle Rock and Sesame Street. I mean, there's icebergs on everything, the most obscure topics, Google Street View, Mass Hysteria, Odd World. You're telling me you people can only cook up one single Muppet iceberg? Where is all the Muppet lore? Could there be a reason why there isn't any? Does Muppet lore even exist? Are the characterizations of these little felt SOBs consistent enough to even form what you'd call lore? Well, let's find out. Let's start with some ground rules. Webster's Dictionary defines lore as whatever I say lore is because it's my channel. Hmm. You know, you can't argue with them. They have hundreds and hundreds of years of experience and make a very good point. But no, seriously, I'm going to flash up on the screen what Muppet content I have seen. If you see half a poster here, it means I partially watched the movie or series. I do plan on finishing the rest of this, which means another one of these videos is probably coming. So please comment below if I missed anything or if I messed anything up, because I'm definitely going to do corrections in that video and I don't want to miss anything. So I appreciate all your comments. Let me know what I screwed up besides my audio. Sesame Street has been brought to you today. Now that that's out of the way, let's kick off this arbitrary and meaningless order at the top with number... Ben! What is he doing? So everybody knows Scooter, one of the best, cutest, and gayest Muppets. But do you all remember how Scooter was introduced to the Muppets? On episode 4 in season 1 of The Muppet Show, Scooter starts buzzing around Kermit, talking about being a gopher, going for coffee, going for cigarettes, whatever people needed in the 70s. And when Kermit tells him to go away, Scooter drops that his uncle owns the theater, quickly changing Kermit's tune. But then we jump forward to the 2011 Muppet movie, where oil tycoon and the second greatest white rapper of all time, Tex Richmond, has bought the Muppet Theater. Cause I got my money! For his nefarious capitalistic schemes. Tex owns that property through Kermit's rich and famous contract, which in a separate bit of consistent continuity, is in reference to the end of the first Muppets movie. But nowhere then is anything said about the theater. I know that the backstory of Tex Richmond went through a lot of changes in production, so I checked out the full version of his villain song to see if there were any mentions of how that property got snuck into that contract. And while there is that weird birthday bit of lore that you don't see in the actual movie, there isn't any explanation of the new terms of this contract, and certainly no mention of Scooter and his uncle. So I went back even farther and checked the original draft of what would become the 2011 Muppet movie, entitled The Greatest Muppet Movie of All Time, written by Jason Siegel and Nicholas Stoller? Stoller? I don't know. And again, there was no mention of this change in the contract and no mention of Scooter and his uncle. In fact, Scooter's barely really in the script, outside of a weird scene where he apparently forgets how to read. Weird for somebody in a showrunner position, but hey, we're not here for Muppet lore inconsistencies and canceled productions. We're here for the real deal, baby. And I gotta say, the disappearance of Scooter's uncle is kinda strange. I think it kinda counts. Unless he had to sell the property to Tex Richmond. But what could have happened in the late 
thousands that would have made somebody sell their real estate. But oh no, that'd be too simple. That'd be too straightforward. It gets more complicated than that. In season four, episode 10 of The Muppet Show, guest starring Kenny Rogers, we find out that Scooter's uncle has sold the property's mineral rights, the right to drill oil, exactly what Tex Richmond wanted the whole time. But he didn't sell it for the entirety of the property. No, he sold it specifically in Kenny Rogers' dressing room. These admittedly very offensive puppets can only drill for oil inside of what I assume is the Muppets' green room. Did they sell those mineral rights to Tex Richmond? And when did the rest of the property become part of the equation? And when did that become part of the rich and famous contract? Who knows? Muppet lore and consistency number 10. Oh my God, this video is gonna take forever. Jesus Christ. Number nine. Nine. So for number nine, we're gonna stick with my boy Scooter. Like I said, you typically see Scooter in a backstage role, but there have been plenty of times where Scooter stepped up to replace Kermit and actually host the show. One of those being in one of my personal favorite Muppet movies, Muppets Most Wanted. You also see Scooter as the actual host of Muppets Now, the internet-based Muppet show on Disney+. Plus. I guess it's internet-based, meme-based, content creator? Baby. But Killian, you're saying. Killian, you're asking. Come on, come on. How's that an inconsistency? He's versatile. He's talented. He can do multiple things. Backstage, on stage, Scooter can handle it all. <laughs> Except for one problem. One very interesting problem. This is Clifford. A Muppet you rarely see anymore for reasons we'll get into. And Clifford was actually the man to step up to host in lieu of Kermit. I'm Clifford, your homie made of foamy. During the 90s show Muppets Tonight, which in a lot of ways is the spiritual successor to the Muppet show. And you can look at my chart and see that I haven't finished Muppets Tonight, but haven't seen much of Scooter. And even though Clifford's role as next man up is kind of forced, he really leans into that role as the show goes on. And even in public appearances too, showing up on Arsenio Hall and all kinds of platforms in the 90s. Hey, what's up? I'm Clifford. Where'd Cliff go? Why don't we see Cliff anymore? Well, that's the thing. Cliff was voiced by this guy, but he was designed by this guy. Which isn't really a problem until you find out that Cliff isn't a catfish. Cliff is a person? A person. Ugh. Okay, moving on, number eight. Eight, eight, eight is great. Miss Piggy, fashion icon, star of the screen and stage, and according to many, herself probably included, a sex symbol. And sometimes when things get hot and heavy with the conversation and flirtation, you see Miss Piggy get a little worked up herself. And with some of the stars she flirts with, who can blame her? Hey. Nathan, sweetie! You gotta move. Uh, am I blocking your light? No, it's your butt. It's super distracting. Piggy being very flirty has always been part of her character from the very beginning. But in season one, episode nine of The Muppet Show, you hear her doing something when things get a little spicy that you haven't heard before or since. Mademoiselle Piggy. The number of telephone of this establishment is Truden 2767. She oinks. And I know she's a pig, so you'd think it'd be expected, but in all the times and all the years that Piggy's been flirting with all these guests, I haven't heard her oink no matter how steamy things get. Babe, can I stroke your hair? I'm <laughs> Don't stop there! <laughs> Even with Kermit. And this isn't just a case of small changes as a character develops early on, like Gonzo's weird baby voice. And then you'll see. You'll all see, because there's only one great Gonzo. Only one! No, there's plenty of times where Piggy gets bricked up, absolutely horned out in those first few episodes of The Muppet Show, and she certainly doesn't oink. At least, not that I've heard. Could it be the dulcet tones of the French dialect making Piggy feel a way that she had never felt before and unfortunately hasn't felt since then? 
Or is this Muppet lore inconsistency number eight? Honestly, I hope for Kermit's sake it's Muppet lore inconsistency number eight. Poor guy, I feel like he's a selfless love boy. Uh, was that snort on the record? As you can see, I actually found another time that Piggy snorts, and that's when ABC did a mockumentary style show called Muppets. In episode 12, A Tale of Two Piggies, Miss Piggy's tail actually pops out on the red carpet, and the stress from that makes her let out a big, loud, nasty snort. I just snorted! Why did I do that? I'm a lady, not a pig! But without getting too much into the brain synapsis of pigs, I can pretty confidently say that stress and being boned all the way up are two very different emotions. Bouncing back to a different queer icon, we have the Great Gonzo. The Great Gonzo. We love Gonzo. But we don't know what Gonzo is. In multiple movies and TV shows, he's referred to as a whatever. No, no. We're bears and frogs. And Gonzos. What, whatever you are. Poking fun at the fact that we don't really know what Gonzo is supposed to be. That is until the 1999 film Muppets from Space when we find out that Gonzo's actually an alien. Not only do we finally find out what Gonzo is, but we get a chance to meet Gonzo's family before they unfortunately have to go back to their home planet, leaving Gonzo with what's been his true family all along, the Muppets. But then you look at episode two of ABC's The Muppets, and as the credits are rolling at the end, Gonzo starts talking about his mom. God, it's happening. Uh, I, I, Good I, I, news, I they found my mother. Hmm? You gotta hear the story, Kermit. No, 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 I can hear it tomorrow, Gonzo. Oh, no, 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 it's uh, really amazing. Well, I'll just ride down with you. Oh, so, oh. the cruise ship has this expedition where you ride goats up Machu Picchu. Oh. You know, my mother's a terrible goat rider. Oh. Showing that he's pretty close to his mother. So either they visit Earth more often than the end of Muppets from Space implies, or maybe we're just looking at Muppet lore inconsistency number seven. Or, there's an even deeper explanation. According to a lot of Muppets fans, Muppets from Space is actually a movie acted out by the Muppets. You know what you're saying, of course it's a movie acted out by the Muppets, it's a Muppet movie. Duh. But no, it's, it's in-universe, it's the Muppets, the characters of the Muppets. God, how do I explain this? The characters of the Muppets are doing characters in this movie? Uh, it's a movie within the Muppets universe. Perfect! But this isn't actually ever acknowledged in the film. This is all according to the guy who plays Gonzo, and who am I to argue with Gonzo himself, but it kind of brings up a bigger discussion of, do you listen to the author, or do you look at the media they actually created? Who's the final decider when it comes to canon? And most importantly, Muppet canon. You know what? I think it should be me. I'm the only one who's making this video. I am the decider of Muppet lore. I'm the decider. Muppets from Space is canon, and this is Muppet lore inconsistency number seven. Six! Keeping the spotlight on our boy Gonzo, everybody knows that the world-famous stuntman loves him some chicken. And not in his famous bowl. From early on in The Muppet Show, he's at an affinity for poultry. Okay, uh, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> nice legs, though. And you can see that in his longtime girlfriend, fan favorite, at least to me. Camilla. But in episode 7 of that previously mentioned short-lived ABC series, it seems like Gonzo completely forgets about Camilla. You're like a Miss America winner who stumbles during the swimsuit competition, but knocks it out of the park in evening wear. Aw, thanks, Gonzo. Ooh, I need a girlfriend. Not to mention how flirty he is with Kristen Bell in the Lady Gaga holiday spectacular, even asking her to dinner. Because you make me nervous. Is he so handsome? Oh, <clears throat> well. <laughs> Let's 
Let's just wrap this thing and go to dinner. <laughs> okay. All right? But all this is kind of explained when you find out later in that ABC series that Camilla walked out on Gonzo. That episode takes place on Groundhog Day of 2016. You find out that it was also Groundhog Day when Camilla left Gonzo. Groundhog Day is an emotional time for Gonzo. Yeah. It's the day that his girlfriend walked out on him. Yeah. Rizzo does say it's been a long time, and since it's the anniversary of that date, it's been at least a year. But Gonzo's also still finding Camilla's stuff in his house. Last night I found a box that Camilla left behind. What was in it? Yeah. There's a few of her egg cozies and then some... Okay, it was all egg cozies. The Lady Gaga Spectacular took place almost two and a half years before this episode aired in November of 2014, meaning Gonzo would have to still be finding Camilla's stuff three years after she broke up with him. Now, Gonzo's a pretty successful fella. He's probably got a very big house, but three years is a long time to keep your ex's stuff, even by accident. To be fair, though, they do get back together by the end of the series. Camilla? And it is confirmed as of a 2020 sci-fi interview that they're happily together having drinks poolside next to Gonzo's, again, pretty big house. But there is one more wrinkle to this chicken issue that I have to address. Now, if you believe the theory put out there by Disney Dan's producer, then these could be attributed to the high turnover rate. Rick, what happened offensively in that period? Turnovers. What about on the defensive end? They had their most productive quarter. What'd you see there? Turnovers. Pop, thank you. Of Gonzo's girlfriends. And we're not talking about breaking up. We're talking about the short lifespan of chickens. So whether it's Gonzo flirting with another woman, saying he doesn't have a girlfriend at all, or Gonzo just hitting on a different chicken, it could just be the fact that chickens don't live very long. Or it could be Muppet inconsistency number six. But hey, if that's not enough for you, that same episode, Gonzo says he needs a girlfriend, Kermit runs into Rolf at a bar, very similar to the first Muppet movie. But it seems like his daily routine has changed a little bit since then. I finish work, I go home, read a book, have a couple of beers, take myself for a walk and go to bed. I go home, draw myself a hot bath, get out, run around the house like a maniac, and chew on an old shoe. To be fair, he does say this is his routine if he's having a bad day. But hey, if you don't like the great chicken conspiracy of 2024, consider that a little half inconsistency. Just to tickle your gizzard, just to wet your whistle, just to hyperextend your... Five. Now it's time to talk about my least favorite Muppet, Lou Zealand. Look at this guy, look at this absolute freak. What is he even supposed to be? What's he supposed to do? My name is Lou Zealand, I'm a boomerang fish goer. Oh, okay, he's the boomerang fish fella, but if he's the boomerang fish fella, half the time he doesn't even catch the fish. He's doing a poor job. If that's his job, he's doing a bad job. But despite all that, even I have to feel bad for the guy. Sorry. Okay. When it comes to Muppet lore inconsistency number five. During the album version of Muppets Most Wanted's We're Doing a Sequel, the only version he's in, he suggests to Kermit doing a fish out of water movie. How about one of those fish out of water movies? But in Muppets Go to the Movies, a promotional special for the great Muppet caper, he clearly states that war movies are his favorite movies. Next on the show is my very favorite kind of motion picture. And here is our special guest star, Lily Tomlin, in a war movie. <laughs> is it because he knows the marketing power of fish and he wants success? He wants his career over something that really means the most to him. He doesn't care about fish. He doesn't care about tilapia or tuna or flounder. No, he cares about war, death, destruction, evil, hordes of bodies stacked higher than the eye can see. Also, yes, I know I said I wouldn't do cut Muppet content, but the album version of a song is an official release, so... Even though we see Lou say this in a deleted scene, it was released as an official song. A slight little difference. Um, but yeah, we feel bad for Lou, even though uh, he's a warmonger. Waka waka! 
But no, seriously, when I say the phrase Muppet Bear, the first name you think of is Fozzie, right? Obviously. But some of your brains may go to this guy. Bobo the Bear debuted on the second episode of Muppets Tonight. Yes! Stars! Hey! Hey, well, we going with... Those are my uh, shorts there. <laughs> Last pair. Even though Fozzie spent some time with some bears that kind of looked like Bobo during his getaway from the gang in Muppets Take Manhattan. Hey, I'm going to New York City to be on Broadway. I'm up, I'm up, this is spring. All right, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up. You can even hear that those bears, especially the first one, even sound a lot like Bobo. But this bear in particular was kind of redesigned and reworked into the Bobo we would all meet as a security guard in Muppets Tonight. <laughs> Plus, according to the 2014 Muppet Character Encyclopedia, Bobo is from Pennsylvania, while Fozzie takes his excursion in Maine, so obviously two different bears. Nice job. <clears throat> but a little redesign isn't the inconsistency. No, the inconsistency is how different Fozzie and Bobo look. You're telling me these creatures are the same species? Are you kidding me? They don't even look like they're from the same planet. Never mind a few states apart, these two guys are galaxies apart. And yeah, Miss Piggy looks different from the other pigs, but she didn't start that way. She started looking like any of them. That's just how her individual character developed. And we're not talking about changes in a puppet. From the very start, Fozzie Bear and Bobo the Bear have looked way different. Now you're probably saying, how's it an inconsistency if they've always looked different? And to that, I say, f you, moving on to number three. What up, wait, should I talk about how it's Fozzie Bear and Bobo the Bear? Like, Fozzie's last name is Bear, but Bobo's got like a sonic thing going on, where his first name is followed by his species. I thought your middle name was The. Should I talk about that? Nah, no, let's move on. Number three. Three. That's right, I got more to say about the funny bear. And that's the problem right there. Fozzie is funny. I know his thing is supposed to be that he's an unfunny comedian, but no, he is the subject of unjust heckling. Fozzie's hilarious. Watch my boy go. So a guy finds a magic lamp and asks the genie inside to make him a sandwich. Poof! Guy gets turned into a roast beef on rye. If there's any way you guys could just act like Piggy and I are still together, just until I have the right time to break the news to him, I'd appreciate it. Act? Yes, that would be fantastic. Huh? It'll be a good chance for me to practice my acting. Mm -hmm. uh, like this. <clears throat> Luke, I am your father. Mm -hmm. I'll have what she's having. You had me yet. Hello. Here's one from Fozzie. Dear Kermit, waka waka waka. But seriously, I'm in Maine. That's right, he's so funny I stole that last joke. But still, Fozzie gets heckled almost every time he's on stage, especially on the original Muppet Show. By these two guys in particular. <laughs> and it seems from the way they're always yucking it up and having a good time that they consider themselves pretty funny guys too. But I'm just gonna come out and say it. They're not nearly as funny as Fozzie. I'm not gonna go through three clips like I did for the bear, but here's a little sample of what Statler and Waldorf are bringing to the table. Something wrong with this TV! What's that? It's on! <laughs> That's not funny at all, it's just negative. They can turn off the TV whenever they want. And same on The Muppet Show, they can leave the theater whenever. I guess they can't, they're attached to somebody's hand. Hmm. You know, it's actually interesting, in one of the drafts of the 2011 Muppet movie, Statler and Waldorf were actually supposed to pay the last dollar to save the Muppet Theater, but that plot point got cut, meaning these two are just negative, old, and more than anything, not as funny as Fozzie. You know what, Fozzie? Hit one more to take it to number two. My cousin is so thin. How thin is he? He's so thin, he paints his head gold and rents himself out as a flagpole. I guess they can't all be winners. The number two. Ah, ah, ah. Ah. 
Muppet lore inconsistency number two is going to be a little different than the last eight. Instead of being about the Muppets, it's actually about the people surrounding the Muppets. I know I've talked about it a ton, but I haven't really discussed the plot of the 2011 Muppet movie. This is Mary. Mary wants to marry Gary, you understand? But Gary spends too much time with his brother Walter, and that really interferes with the relationship going to the next level, which leads to this line during the opening number. Except Gary's always off with his friend. His friend? That's his brother, dude. That's your future brother-in-law, and you're calling him his friend? Oh, it's just a rhyme with end in the next line of the song. No, inexcusable. No way. There's tons of stuff you could rhyme with brother. Other, another. That's just two examples. And don't give me that BS about how, yeah, they're friends, they even refer to each other as friends, no, they're brothers. And no matter how close they are, it would still be weird to call them friends instead of, you know, siblings. His friend, yeah, right, what a silly thing to say. And it's even sillier when you think about the fact that, you know, like I said, I don't want to be Mr. Scientist here, okay? I'm not going to get into the biology of people versus Muppets. But from the looks of it, Walter might be adopted. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. We could be twins. But either way, referring to these brothers as friends is at least wrong and at most pretty offensive. Oh, is that weak? Two cinema sins? A weird song lyric in one movie isn't lore enough for you? Okay, I hear you. I understand. That's why number one, number one is the biggest inconsistency in the history of the Muppets. One nipple, ah, ah, ah. Save the most rock and rollin'est, the most riff a doodle, the most laudacious entry for last for number one. That's right, we're talking about Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. We can rock and roll with anybody. The Mayhem have been with the Muppets since the very beginning, first popping up on the pilot episode of The Muppet Show. But not every member of the Mayhem has been around that long. You're looking at Lips, who joined the Mayhem near the end of the Muppet Show run in the last couple seasons. Then he popped up in the Great Muppet Caper before eventually disappearing again to the 2011 Muppet movie. Now since then he's been around pretty consistently, but his appearances aren't the lore inconsistency, no. Instead it's his voice. When Lips first popped up he sounded like this. Which is a pretty offensive accent for a white puppeteer to be doing. Eventually changing it so it sounds like this in The Great Muppet Caper. They say he has some lines before they sing Nightlife too, but I don't think that's accurate. I think that's Floyd saying that. I think everyone else is wrong. In The Great Muppet Caper, his voice is kind of gruff. He sounds like a more legible animal. Okay. But after his long disappearance, his voice would be different again. Sounding like this on the 2015 ABC show. And we love us some gas station sushi. No, right. <laughs> what is up with this guy? An offensive accents. Good grief. Is that his voice? Is that what he's supposed to sound like? Is he doing an accent there? I think maybe so because he doesn't sound that way when he gets dialogue later in The X Factor, Going Going Gonzo, and Little Green Lie. Yeah, but leave home at 14? Why, what, you think the boy's got access to a time machine? But regardless of whatever accent he was trying to do there, his voice sounds different again in the 2023 series Muppets Mayhem. Now he kind of sounds like Boomhauer from King of the Hill, where he's mumbling, but if you really listen, you can kind of understand what he's saying. So what the heck is going on with the man's voice? Why does it keep changing? Why did he disappear for so long? Are the problematic voices the reason? Or is it just happenstance that the fella disappeared for almost 30 years right before Muppets Take Manhattan came? Now, or are we rocking with Muppet lore inconsistency number one? Hold up, apparently people say that Muppets Take Manhattan is a play? Is that why he's not in it? Because it's a play? But how's it a play? It's a movie. It's 
quite clearly a movie. And speaking of movies, Kermit says that the original Muppet movie is more or less the origin story of the Muppets. Is this about how the Muppets really got started? Well, it, it's sort of approximately how it happened. If that's the case, then what's real and what's just the movie? And even more so than that, how the hell do Muppet Babies factor into the equation? Oh my god, I haven't even thought about Muppet Babies until right now. Oh, that's so much content I have to watch, so much lore I have to figure out. Oh, please don't make me. I don't want to watch Muppet Babies. Please, no, 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 no. No. No, I don't think I will. If I've learned one thing over the process of researching for this video is that Muppet lore is our lore. Okay, I'm not crazy. I haven't lost my mind completely. Hear me out. When you see a Muppet on a modern day talk show like Jimmy Kimmel, do you see the puppeteer with them? No, that's because the celebrity is the Muppet. The Muppets exist in our world. The real world is the Muppet universe. All these celebrities they meet, that's the actual celebrities. Sure, sometimes they're playing characters, but those characters exist in addition to the actual celebrities themselves. Just look at how many times Danny Trejo has been in the Muppets recently. Kermit isn't a cartoon character. These aren't fictional things. They're actual tangible entities that you can touch and feel and talk to. That's why I think that Muppet lore doesn't matter. It's all about how the Muppets make you feel. It's not about what they've done in the past or if their characters are going to be consistent in the future. It's all about how they're making you feel right now, right in this moment. That's why I love the Muppets. The heart, not the brain. The heart. That being said, I'm going to do another one of these bad boys, but I think I'm going to do Muppet lore consistencies. But in that video, I'm going to correct any mistakes I made in this video. So whatever I messed up, please let me know in the comments. Give a little kissy kissy to that subscribe button. <laughs> oh, kissy kissy! <laughs> that would be super appreciated. And speaking of things that are super, I have super good news. I have invested in a new microphone for these videos, so all audio jokes aside, hopefully it will improve. Here, I'll actually switch over to it now. Let's drop the music. We'll get rid of the D reverb. Ooh, I bet that is sounding awful. But now we will switch to the good microphone, so hopefully that sounds better. But yeah, next video, it is out with the blue Yeti and in with the blue doggies. Bye, love you.